everybody, and welcome to East Meets West, a lecture demonstration between Parat Natyam and Ballet. And we are all so glad that you can make it here today with us. I know it's a Sunday evening, we have work or school tomorrow, but just forget about that for an hour and a half. And just, we're here to entertain you. We hope that you will like it. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so to begin, who are we? Um, my name is Mira Menon. I'm 16. I'm a junior at Panther Creek High School. I'm sure a lot of y'all know me, but yeah. <laughs> and my name is Thera Balu. I'm 17 and a senior at Apex High School. So, dancing has always been one of my greatest passions. I began Barthenactium at the age of seven. It's such a challenging yet rewarding journey, and I hope to be able to share everything I've learned over the years with you guys today. And my passions are dancing, singing, and playing piano. And I started learning Paranatyam when I was six years old, so a long time ago. But um, ever, I've loved it ever since. And Mira and I have a combined learning experience of Paranatyam of 20 years. <laughs> and um, we learned from the Karachishti School of Performing Arts from our amazing teacher, Meena Rajkopa. Mira, why are we here today? Good question, Mira. So we've always taken an interest in other dance forms apart from our own and identified ballet as a widely known classical dance form that really parallels in technique to Bharatanatyam. So one day we were just sitting and talking and we were like, we just came up with this cool idea to bring both of these wonderful dance forms together to explore their similarities, differences, and cultures, and share it with diverse audiences and just educate the community in general. So, so in order to make this project possible, we teamed up with Infinity Ballet. Um, I'd like to introduce Hannah and Aubrey because they've made this project as amazing as it is today. Hi, I'm Hannah Green. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Hannah Green. I'm 18 years old, and I recently graduated from Infinity Ballet after dancing there for 13 years. I'm now a psychology major at NC State University, and I'm a dancer with NC State's Panoramic Dance Project. Hi, my name is Aubrey Hull. I'm 17 years old and currently a senior at Apex Friendship High School. I've been dancing at Infinity Valley for 14 years, uh, ever since I was three years old. Um, and now I have the wonderful opportunity to, um, this will be my second year as official faculty there, teaching my own lessons on Saturday mornings to young aspiring ballerinas. got to know us a little bit more. Let's dive into what these dance forms are all about, because that's why we're here, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Paratnatyam. When you hear Paratnatyam, you may think ex uh, extravagant costumes, makeup, and jewelry, but it is so much more than that. Paratnatyam is one of the oldest dance forms to originate in southern India, and it was performed exclusively in Hindu temples, depicting many famous Hindu mythological stories. And Paranatyam in itself incorporates a variety of technical aspects, but these aspects help portray stories that a dancer will show on stage. And then in turn, these stories give the audience a chance to really connect with what's going on, on during a performance. All right, I want to ask everybody, what do you think of when you hear the word ballet? Tiptoes. Tiptoes. <laughs> Anything else? Tiptoes. Tiptoes. Point shoes. Anything else? Beauty. Beauty. I like your answer. I like your So there's a lot of things that come to mind when we hear the word ballet, or maybe not. But hopefully today, you'll learn something new about ballet. Okay, so to kind of begin with the origins of Bharatanatyam, it originated in southern India in a state called Tamil Nadu. It was based on the Natya Shastra, which is kind of like a classical text detailing how to portray emotions on stage, written by Bharatamuni, hence the name Bharatanatyam. So it was originally performed at temples or places of worship by Devadasis, or experienced dancers, and it has gone through a lot of evolutions to be the art form that it is today. <laughs> Alright, so the origins of ballet. Um, for many of you who may not know, ballet 
Latin didn't actually start here in the States. Um, it came all the way from the Italian Renaissance courts, where it was reserved as a means of entertainment for the aristocratic society um, and to entertain the royal families. And with time, it was introduced to other countries such as Russia and France, and eventually it's made its way here into the United States. So now we're going to get into like the nitty gritty of both the bar. Not super nitty gritty, I promise, not to be boring. But, um, so we're going to start with the Bharatanatyam basics. So Bharatanatyam is known to have three main streams or aspects. So the first one is Nritta, which is pure technical dance. So this basically means sequences of dance without any implied meaning to the audience. The second one is Abhinaya, which is all about the facial expressions that a dancer will use to portray stories through emotion. And then the third one is nritya, which is the combination of both nritya, pure dance, and abhinaya, facial expressions, just making the dance as a whole very interpreted. Yay. <laughs> this is still me talking. Every time we run this presentation, I forget I'm supposed to talk here. <laughs> okay, so for the basics of ballet, um, there are two main, I guess you could say, styles to ballet. Well, even then, the term style may not be the best word to use. But we have classical ballet, which is very, as it sounds, classical is going to be your fundamental kind of starting place of uh, ballet. And then over time, we've had um, people like George Balanchine, one of the big names in uh, ballet here in America. And he would take these classical elements and tweak them maybe take away some of those feminine aspects, make things a little more angular and sharp and intricate, and just be different, giving it the title of neoclassical ballet. And so today, we do see a lot of mixture um, within companies, within performances. The piece you just watched had a lot of neoclassical elements to it. Um, so yeah. Okay, so at this point in the lecture, we'd like to invite the demonstrators for this evening to come up on stage. provide a visual representation of everything we're just going to be kind of talking about. So I'm going to be talking about artaboos, which are the basic building blocks of Bharatanatyam. So artaboos are kind of a combination of leg movement, hand gestures, and body posture that come together to form steps. So I'd like to invite Nikita to go through some of the common artaboos, but before she does anything, she's going to start with a namaskaram, which is a kind of invocation of blessings before the dancer embarks on her journey. So, um, I'm going to go through the jati, or the spoken syllable that has no meaning that the dancer will do the artabu to before I go through each artabu. So, starting with the tat artabu, which is the basic te ya te, so te ya te, te ya te, and then we have the nat artabu, which is te yum tat te te ta, so te yum tat te te ta, te yum tat te te ta, then we have the kuritamitta artabu, which is te ha te. Say hat day, say hat day, say hat day, say hat day, and then we have the sutra dhuva, which is they they did they. So they they did did they. And now we're going to be kind of going through a sequence of how these adhus would combine together to show you what that would look like. I'll only say your jeffy this time. Okay. Da they they da did they they da did they did they da ka da ki da. They have to train very hard because although ballet is an art, it's also very athletic. So most dancers start from a very young age. Say, when did you start dancing, Aubrey? I started dancing when I was three. Julia? Three. Selena? Three. I started when I was five. And the reason for this is because there are a lot of muscles that dancers use that we don't use in our everyday life. And we have to build up these muscles as well as um, strengthening and stretching them at the same time. And we also develop our turnout, which is why you can usually spot a dancer because she kind of walks like a duck. <laughs> and 
So classes are typically 90 minutes long. Um, dancers are usually at the studio six days a week. And um, we start at the bar, and then we go into the center. And these classes are pretty formal. Um, normally, when you enter the classroom or when you're about to leave, you perform a reverence to the teacher. Can you demonstrate a reverence for us, ladies? And this is just to respect the teacher and, if you're lucky, a live pianist. <laughs> so these classes are really important because they build the foundation of our dancing. And even professionals go back and take beginner level classes because the technique is that important. Okay, so now we're going to talk about these things. Very important in Bharatnatya. So we call these mudras or hand gestures. And mudras are used to display outer feelings as well as inner feelings as well as the physical surroundings of a dancer when they're portraying a story or situation on stage. And asamita astahas are mudras displayed with one hand, while samita astahas are mudras displayed with two hands. So there are a couple of pictures on the slide. So from the top left corner, we have patakam, alapadmam, katakamukam, and mayuram. So those are just a few examples, but I would like to invite Anupama now, who will just demonstrate how some of mud like how, hmm, how mudras like these would come into play during a dance. So first we have a bird. Then we have Shiva, who is the god of destruction. Then we have a flower. And finally, a snake. So port de bras means carriage of the arms, and these arms help coordinate our movements and help to convey different styles and even characters. There are six basic port de bras ranging from Julia, um, demi port de bras, first port de bras, and even more complex forms like six port de bras. Yeah, yeah. This may have been one you recognized from the first piece we performed. And like I said before, <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> like I said before, they can help convey different characters. So Say Julie is a doll, she's going to have more angular, rigid arms. And if she's a snowflake, she's also going to have some more angular arms and maybe catch some snowflakes at the same time. And if we're in a more Spanish influenced dance like Don Quixote, we might have a hip on the arm. I mean, hip on the arm. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, these arms are very important in establishing style as well as helping us dance. Okay, so on to the mandalas, or the leg positions in Bharatanatyam. So Nikita will come up and show some of the common mandalas that a dancer will take. So starting off Stanaka, which is the basic resting phase in Bharatanatyam, as you can see her hands are on, on her hip and her feet are together. Next we have Ayata or Aramandi, which is the most basic Bharatanatyam mandala. And as you can see, her feet are facing outwards and she's kind of in a half sit position and her knees are also bent. Now the full sit would be called Murumandi, and she's all the way down. And then we have Alida, which is a diagonal step backwards, along with Pratyalida, which is a step forwards. Then we have Prenkana, in which one foot is resting on the other in Aramandi. Prerita, which is a lunge forward. And finally, Swastika, in which one foot is crossed over the other. All right, that was lovely to watch. So for ballet, we do, yes, have our arms, which oftentimes our audience does get so caught up in our arms doing wonderful, pretty porta bras, but we also have the downstairs. We've got our legs and our feet. So I'd like to invite Selena out to demonstrate the five basic positions of the feet that we use in ballet, starting with first position, where her feet are turned outwards going into second, where her, feet are, her heels rest just underneath her hip bones and crossing into third. And third position acts as a preliminary fifth position, as young dancers are not quite able to cross their legs all the way completely, especially with their body still growing and changing. And she'll go into fourth position, where if you're looking down, her feet are toe to heel, toe to heel, with about a foot's length in between. And she'll close to fifth, where her feet look nice and tight in the shoe box. 
you can relax. That's great. So <laughs> it's not very comfortable to stand around. But. So all these, all the basic five positions of the feet, they build onto each other and transfer into point work. Um, hence the shoes that Selena are wearing. If you jump up really quick, where she can dance on her toes. Okay. So in the process, like, amazing, right? Okay. So. In the works of uh, practicing this lecture demonstration, we actually stumbled across a lot of similarities in some of the elements we are going to be demonstrating. So I'd like to invite you back out. Yes, and we're going to show you some of the positions that we almost accidentally came across. Yeah, so starting off with Adamandi in Bharatanatyam, for ballet we call this demi plie. And then going down into Budamandi's grand plie. And typically a ballet dancer is not going to hang out down here, it's more of a transition kind of stuff. <laughs> Alida. Uh, we'll take a ta ooh, good morning. We'll take a tendu écarté devant. Pratyalida. Tendu effacé derrière. Swastika. Croisé derrière. And what was interesting about this finding was that it was very typical in Bhagavatam for the leg to be crossed in the front, whereas in ballet it's more common for it to be in the back. And finally, break it off. And we'll take sur le coup de pied. Again, not something we kind of just hang out in. <laughs> okay, so now we would like to talk about Abhinaya, or facial expressions, which, as we mentioned earlier, is the second main aspect of Bharatanatyam. So Abhinaya is very important because it really helps create the mood of a story, like we said earlier, when a dancer is portraying uh, a situation or an event, and like I said earlier, famous Hindu mythological stories. So in Bharatanatyam, there are the nine main emotions called the Navarasas. Nava meaning nine in Sanskrit. So I would like to invite Anupama once again to demonstrate what each, what each Navarasa consists of. So first we have Shringaram, which means love. Then we have Hasyam, which means laughter. <laughs> yeah, like what you're doing now. <laughs> okay, Karunam, which means compassion. Then we have Adbutam, which means wonder or surprise. Then we have Bibatsam, which means disgust. <laughs> Vidam, which means bravery. Rodram, which means anger. Bhayanakam, which means fear. And finally, for the ninth one, Shantam, which means peace. So in ballet, while we may not have set and named facial, uh, facial expressions, um, we do have similar elements that kind of take the same place. So I'm going to have Julia come out first. And so we're going to kind of equate this to what is called a And essentially, it's the uh, coordination of our upper body, arms, and head that complete a line. And without proper a you're actually not doing your positions and movements correct. So, Julia, if you could take a tanya quasi de ma for me. This looks cool, right? It's like, oh, pretty. But it's actually not correct. If she uses her a wow. Yeah? You see a difference? Not only can this, it's more appealing to the eye, but oftentimes the dancer will look larger and be dancing beyond her fingertips. You can that's really great. Um, and so Ipoma is also used to, uh, it transfers into pantomime, which is our, you could say, facial expressions where we're able to tell the obvi obvious points of a story. So if Selena and Julia, if you could jump back out here again. Um, this will be an excerpt of a little pantomime from our version of the Nutcracker. Um, Selena will be kind of looking like our sugar from Barry, and Julia's going to be Claire. The context of this is uh, young Clara has just made her way out of the land of snowflakes, battle with soldiers and mice, oh my. Very good, girls. Sugar Plum exchanged each other with a curtsy. That was a simple way of greeting one another. One another, very common. And we then saw Julia do this weird thing with her hands. She was telling the story. There were mice. There was a battle. 
There was a stabbing, and then there was death. Yes, it's a kid-friendly show, I promise. Um, but so, with the use of facial expression and these obvious arm gestures, we're able to really add um, excitement to a story. The same way for Badanatium, we have facial expressions. Okay, so on to the Bharatanatyam costume, which is probably one of the most eye-catching features of Bharatanatyam. And um, as you can see here, they're always in very vivid and bright colors, and they kind of mimic the traditional Indian sari with their embroidery. And as always, also, there are folds in the bottom half of the costume that can open up when the dancer takes various postures. So as you can see, when Anu Pama is taking Urumandi, her fan is opened all the way up, and when Nikita takes Aramandi, it kind of opens up mostly. So you guys can relax. Um, the costume for Bharatanatyam is not just the costume itself. There's also the extravagant jewelry that adorns the dancer that also serves holistic purposes as long, along with kind of making it more eye-catching to the audience. Along with that, they have the ankle bells that accentuate all the foot beats that they enunciate throughout the performance, and heavy cost, um, cosmetics or makeup that you can see their eyes are very drawn out, along with on their fingertips and on their feet, they have red dye to show every small movement of the hands and the toes. So, of course, in ballet, we have the beautiful classical tutu. However, when ballet first started, dancers wore very long skirts because showing your legs is scandalous. Even longer than you can. Yes. <laughs> Maybe ankle bones. But as dancers started to move more with their legs and start to really strengthen the muscles in their legs, they want to show that off. So, slowly, the skirts got shorter and shorter into the romantic tutu and then up into the pancake tutu that we know today. Another um, aspect of ballerina that makes a ballerina is her point shoes. Um, again, when ballet first originated, there were no point shoes. Dancers wore satin slippers, and to create the illusion of floating, sometimes they were kind of lifted up a little bit into the air with wires, and their toes would just kind of skim across the ground. But Marie Taglioni was the first ballerina to do a full-length ballet on point. She didn't actually have actual point shoes like we do today. Today we have very supportive shoes. So if you could tap your shoe there to show how hard it is. Yeah, so now we have the box to support it, but she just darned the ends. And what she did was she bore it across the floor, and the audience was shocked. As you can see, point shoes create things very material and creates this illusion of flotation, whereas on flat it's not as um, smooth. It's still pretty though, yes. <laughs> so over time, um, dancers were able to do more complex steps as the shoe hardened. So before they might just do a little arabesque on and off the sh shoe, just like that. But today, we can do more cool things like pirouettes because our shoes can support us. That's what they're standing on. Very, very intense paper mache. Yes. And we... Oops. There we go. Um, we also wear a lot of makeup, it helps us get into character, but also it um, helps define our features. And we wear our hair up so that when we turn, our hair doesn't fly into our eyes and it's a distraction. It also extends the line, so as you can see, we try to make, if you turn to the side, our bun kind of extend past the cheekbone to kind of extend the line outward. So dance can't exist without music, right? So now we're going to talk about Bharatanatyam music. So Bharatanatyam is paired with Carnatic music, which also originated in southern India. And they work really well together because the precision of Carnatic music matches the Bharatanatyam beats and just everything in general. 
So, uh, Carnatic music, when it's being used with the Bharanatyam performance, it can either be live or recorded. And typically, for an Arangetram, which is considered a Bharanatyam dancer's graduation of learning the dance form, live music is most popularly used. So, now I'm going to say a couple examples of some instruments that would be used during a performance. So, first we have the Muradangam, which is a double sided drum, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. It's kind of a clip art picture. We're going to find an actual one. This one. Um, and then we have the Natabangam, which are cymbals. And then we have a Veena, which is an Indian stringed instrument, which you can see at the top of the slide. And then flutes and violins can be used as well. So these instruments really help create the mood of a story or situation that a dancer would be depicting. So for example, if there's a scary or suspenseful scene, the Murudangam would be used a lot. And, but if there's a more sympathetic or sad scene, a flute or a violin may be used. On the same note, <laughs> she made this joke yesterday. Yeah. It was unintended too. It was great. But um, ball in ballet, music is used to create the overall mood of the dance. I mean, dancing and music, it goes hand in hand. But um, it can cue the audience into what kind of character is about to come on. So if an evil character is about to come on, you might hear more of a rumbling, dark music. But say Sugar Plum is coming on, you'll hear her theme music. And the gr something that's really interesting about ballet is that there's, if you're dancing with a live orchestra, there's a relationship between the dancer and the conductor. So say if a dancer is balancing on her toes, then the conductor might hold I guess the people playing the music for longer so that she can balance. And so it goes both ways. So at this point, we would like to thank our demonstrators for all the hard work, hard work and effort they put in this. destruction to buildings, left many people homeless, and it was just not a good situation. And that coupled with the hurricane here, Hurricane Florence in North Carolina that everyone is aware of, and we really, both of these causes were so close to our hearts, and we wanted to be able to donate everything from tonight, split between both of these causes and the flood relief, along with the hurricane relief as well. So, also, this concludes the lecture part of our demonstration, but we hope throughout this lecture you've gained enough knowledge about these two beautiful art forms to enjoy the next three performances we have planned, and thank you!